Hello and welcome to Nature Knowledge. This is a speaker series with experts sharing scientific knowledge on current issues affecting nature in Florida. I'm your host, Dr. Shelley Johnson, State Specialized Agent in Natural Resources with University of Florida IFAS Extension. Thanks for joining us today. It is my pleasure to um, introduce the topic for this month. To two wrongs make a right, uh, the role of biological pest control. And our host uh, speaker, guest, guest speaker this month is Dr. Emily Krauss. She's a biological scientist at the Florida Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services. And this is a topic I've always uh, found very interesting. I always have like mixed feelings about it. Like, is it good? Is it bad? Uh, introducing things to get rid of other things that we don't want that are introduced. and. Um, so I know we've made a lot of great progress in this topic in general over the last, you know, 20 years. And so I'm pretty excited to hear about what Emily has to say today. Um, so I will stop sharing my screen and then I will let Emily share her screen and then she can go ahead and um, introduce herself further and tell us all about our control. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Johnson, for inviting me to talk today. I'm very happy to have the opportunity to share with you all my thoughts on do two wrongs make a right and the role that biological control plays in pest management. Um, I wanted to give you a little bit of background about myself so you know where I've come from. I did my undergraduate, master's, and PhD all in departments of entomology. So I've always been working with plant insect interactions and some aspect of integrated pest management. And it was when I started my postdoc at Rhodes University in South Africa that I started to become very invested in biological control. That was my main project there, biological control in water hyacinth. And the experience that I gained from uh, my postdoc is what prepared me for this position with the Florida Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services where I'm the head of several biological control programs for the management of invasive species. And what my whole talk today is going to be about is going to be about the management of invasive species. And so I wanted to carry on from here and just describing or defining what an invasive species is and acknowledging what some of them are that we've seen here in Florida or heard about in the news. So, an invasive species is any non-native in the ecosystem that you're considering that is causing damage environmentally, economically, or to human health. So uh, from this slide, you see, I'm sure, some, um, some figures that have been in the media, the cane toad and lionfish. And then there's also water hyacinth, as I said, I worked on in South Africa, and it's also here in Florida. Uh, water hyacinth was induced introduced into the United States in 1884. And I heard stories that it was also introduced to other places around the world because someone brought it to one of the world fairs in the 1800s and were handing it out to folks to take home. So this plant is from South America and it's now invaded many other areas of the world. Um, we've also got some other plant introductions here that I think many of you may have heard of, which is kudzu vine which was actually promoted by the uh, Soil Conservation Service for Erosion Control. So not bad enough that the plant was introduced, but there was actually encouragement to spread it around even further. And then the paper mulberry was also brought here in the early 1900s. And people thought that it would be a pretty ornamental plant, that it would produce shade. And people in Hawaii were actually using it to um, create, or to use to, to make paper. And so, various organisms brought here for various different reasons. Each of these plants we now know are invasive and cause a lot of problems to us. We've also had some introductions of species that are herbivores that eat our native plants. And some of these are the nutria, which is now a big problem in Louisiana. Uh, it's an herbivore also from South America. We've had the Asian citrus psyllid introduced into Florida and that one was actually relatively recent. So 1998 is when we first noticed that it was here and it was an accidental introduction. It came in on some citrus and began causing problems. It's very problematic because it transmits the uh, citrus greening bacteria or HLB 
And so this has very much been an economically devastating introduction. Another herbivore that was introduced uh, recently in 2002 into Michigan was the emerald ash borer. This was also accidental. It came in wood packing material and is killing ash trees, uh, absolutely devastating uh, that aspect of our ecosystem in the U.S. now. Um, besides herbivores, we've also got predators that were introduced. These stand out a lot because generalist feeders or things that have a large array of what they can feed on are often the ones that we talk about the most because they cause damage to so many other organisms. So while your cat may not actually kill you, whether it wants to or not, it is killing and cats are killing a billion birds a year in the US, as well as some of our amphibians and reptiles. So while many people don't think of cats as an invasive species, they were not native to the US and they are having a negative effect on our ecosystem. Um, some predators that we really acknowledge as invasives and are actually trying to um, contradict the introductions of were cane toads, which were intentionally introduced into Australia for cane beetle control, and the harlequin ladybird, uh, which is a ladybug that was introduced into the US uh, in the early 1900s for aphid control. And so we've definitely learned from these intentional introductions that uh, bringing invasive species or bringing species that are not native to your area can be very detrimental. Uh, so we, we definitely want to be very careful about um, our introductions and make sure that anytime we consider biological control that we have good reason for it. So, uh, in invasion management, once the once we when we consider these pests, we think about how what do we do? First of all, the easiest thing is to do prevention. FDOX has a good program called Don't Pack a Pest. This is our program where we try to generate awareness in the public and we use our adorable beetle lion or not beetle, beagle lioness to promote outreach to folks to make people aware that you may accidentally be bringing things across borders as you travel. Um, back when we all were actually traveling, that is. So we want to make sure that we do everything that we can to prevent invasions because that's step number one in invasive species management is just to not allow species to become invasive, keep things where they belong. Uh, the next step would be eradication or control depending on the extent of the invasion, how established they are and how widespread they are. And this is actually the aspect of invasion management that I'll be talking about today. So um, how do we control them? Can we eradicate them? And what is this process is what the rest of my talk will be about. But the last step just to be complete with invasion management would be that after you do eradication or control, you do ecosystem restoration. So once we've got the invasive species managed and we're reduced the negative impacts from that species, we can then replant or relocate our native species back into that area to try to restore that ecosystem. As for eradication and control, what we would do first, and as anyone who works in pest management knows, is to identify the pests. You can't do proper pest management if you don't know exactly what you're dealing with. So you must properly identify the pests, understand its life cycle, life history, what other organisms it's likely to be associated with. And this is how you're going to get your, um, your best management strategy um, obtained. So identify the pests and then look at containment or assess the extent of the invasion. Are we going to be able to contain and eradicate this pest or are we only going to be able to at best do implement some type of management and try to control it? So once you've made this decision, are you going to eradicate or control, you then need to determine what your action is going to be. And your action should be involving a, um, a strategy of different tools. So this is integrated pest management, not just using one magic bullet because there never is one, but using multiple tools that you have, at, at, have access to or multiple resources to try to make the most complete and sustainable management plan. Often this starts with mechanical control, which is physical or cultural removal or sanitation of organisms because that's something that pretty much you would always have access to. You can go out and 
pull plants out of the ground or pick insects off of uh, plants and things along those lines. Um, However, there is an extent to which if your invasion is vast, that this is no longer going to be able to, to manage that species. So you need to incorporate other aspects into your integrated management plan. And often then the next thing we go to are herbicides, insecticides, or fungicides. So our chemical means. If you can't physically manage it, then you consider these chemical means. And in situations where you've exhausted other options, um, mechanical, chemical, cultural, this is when we then consider biological control. And this is what I do. So what is biological control? Generally, we think of biological control as being categorized into several different areas. The first one is conservation. Conservation biological control just involves conserving the natural enemies that are there. So generating habitat to promote uh, insect predators, uh, parasitoids, and other natural enemies to whatever your invasive pest may be. So conserving your natural native uh, predators. Augmentation biological control is when you boost those populations. So you get online and order a native species to supplement or augment the species that are already there. So you're just increasing the population of natural enemies that would have been in your area otherwise, and you're just uh, giving them a helping hand to boost them to try to manage your pests. People generally don't have a problem with conservation or augmentation biological control because they just involve increasing the levels of natural enemies that are already present in your area or including um, additional natural enemies that are native to the region. Uh, the area of biological control where people get nervous is classical biological control. This involves importing natural enemies from the native area of the species that has invaded. And when we consider doing this, there is a, a long strategy behind it. Uh, choosing and incorporating classical biological control into your integrated pest management strategy often takes a decade or more when it's done correctly. So how is it done correctly? How do we choose our biological control agents? Well, first we'll go to the native range and look at what are the natural enemies of our invasive species there. And of those natural enemies, which of them cause a lot of damage to the invasive organ, organism that we're trying to control? Uh, the example that I have here is the Asian citrus psyllid and Tamarexia radiata. Uh, Tamarexia radiata is a parasitoid that is capable of killing 500 um, psyllid nymphs throughout its lifetime. So we consider that to be high damage. This is one reason why this parasitoid was a good choice for a biological control agent. The other thing is their ability to disperse. If you're looking at including classical biological control into a pest management plan, you don't want to have to physically take that agent to each area on your own. Your hope is that it can disperse itself. And Tamarixia, for example, are very good at seeking out and destroying, so to speak. They're good hunters. They are very good at finding uh, the psyllids. The most important thing, though, the thing that matters above all else is host specificity. And this means that the organism that you're considering as an agent has a very, very narrow range of what it can consume and reproduce on. For example, with the T. radiata, it can only eat the Asian citrus psyllid. And only when you've satisfied host specificity is it possible to consider an agent for biological control. This is the area that makes people nervous. And this is why doing biological control properly can take a long time. But if you don't do this, this is when you end up with nightmares like the cane toad or the harlequin lady beetle. So host specificity is integral to a biocontrol program. Like I said, you, you don't want something that's a generalist. You don't want cats or lady beetles, things that eat a lot of different species. You want something that just eats hopefully one species or a very, very narrow range. Um, so how do we determine host specificity? What we do is something called centrifugal host specificity testing. This involves first looking at very closely related organisms. So if we were going to introduce a biological control agent for water hyacinth, it has been reclassified in recent years to be in the genus Pontidaria. 
we would look at other uh, plants in the Pontedaria genera. And so pickerel weed is native to Florida. It's in the same genus. And so if we were going to introduce an agent here, we would want to make sure that we're not introducing something that could feed on one of our native plants. So we start with species that are very closely related and then we move out broader, so more distantly related, things in the same family or things in the same order. And eventually we get to things that are not related at all, but are important to us, things that are agricultural or economically important species. Maybe we're growing some other kind of an aquatic flower that we're selling and we make a lot of money off of it. Well, in this case, that's something we would want to test. So this, this takes a long time, but it's the only way to um, safely select a biological control agent. And once we've selected an agent and then released it, what's our anticipated outcome of biological control? Um, some of you might recognize the plant in this picture. This is the Brazilian pepper tree. It's invasive to Florida. And we recently released uh, thrips against this. And what we anticipate or what we hope from releasing an agent like this is that it will, first of all, reduce the invasive population. Goal number one is that you choose a biological control agent and it kills the thing that you're introducing it to, to manage. So reduction of the invasive population should result in a decrease of the negative effects from this species. So we hope that we reduce its population and thereby reduce the negative effects it's having on the ecosystem. <clears throat> Next, I have eradication on the slide, and I have a question mark next to that. And that's because it depends very much on what system you're looking at as to if eradication or control are your goals. For example, with Brazilian pepper tree and air potato vine, these organisms are now so pervasive throughout Florida's ecosystems and landscapes that it may be impossible to eradicate them. And so our anticipated outcome when we release biological control agents for these species is more of management and manipulation, reducing those negative impacts, but probably not eradication. We would need to implement other, implement other strategies of IPM, such as mechanical and chemical control in combination with biocontrol to hope for eradication. But biocontrol itself in these examples would not work. That's why I have the question mark there. So it's dependent upon the system whether or not biological control can eradicate or assist with eradication. And finally, something that is very important with using biological control um, in your management system is that you don't want to be perpetually producing and releasing these organisms. The idea is that you release them, they establish, and then they reproduce and carry on on their own. And if they do consume all of the invasive species, it's self-limiting in that the agent itself then also dies because it no longer has a food source. But what you don't want to be doing is bring in a biological control agent that will never be able to establish or survive on its own because that takes away from the cost effectiveness of the plan. And as I said, you're, you're looking at natural organisms now, which should be self, both self-sustaining and self-limiting. And so our anticipated outcome is that eventually we stop producing the biocontrol agents and nature takes its own course. There have been multiple successes with biological control in the United States. Uh, some of these are the air potato beetle. It's been doing a fantastic job here in Florida. Tamarixia radiata has been doing a great job with assisting in management and reducing insecticide applications in citrus. Uh, there's the Salvinia weevil there. This weevil is uh, host specific to Salvinia molesta and Salvinia minima, which are both invasive in the southern U.S. Um, it has been uh, managing Salvinia molesta in, in Louisiana very successfully, and we've released it on Salvinia minima. Um, some people call it water spangles, and I've also heard people refer to it as duckweed um, here in Florida. And then there's also the plant hopper on the right, um, that's Megamellus scutellaris, and it has been released here for um, assistance in management of water hyacinth. So in each of these cases, we see no non-target effects. We see some assistance in the management or control of the invasive species. And so since biological control has come a long way and become much safer in that we spend a lot more time in assessing the host specificity, particularly of our organisms, 
we have had some, some great success in biocontrol in the US. And because I am leading the air potato beetle program, I now want to, to talk for a while about it. Uh, the air potato vine, Dioscoria bulbifera, invaded the US from subtropical Asia. It's a twining and climbing vine. It produces dense mats that completely cover vegetation along forest floors and other areas. Um, in the laboratory and in the greenhouse, we've seen it grow as much as six inches in a day. It doesn't grow six inches every day forever, but it does have these big growth spurts and it can grow like up to 65 or 70 feet into the air. I have people all the time telling me that it's choked out their trees, that nothing else is growing in the area. And so the negative impacts of this species are very severe. As it grows up into the trees, um, it produces these aerial bulbils. These are its reproductive structures, and this is where it gets the name air potato from. These are nutrient-filled reproductive structures that can be as small as a pea or as big as a grapefruit, and regardless of their size, they will hit the soil, hit the pavement, uh, fall out of the, off of the canopy, and they'll start to grow new vines in the next year. I have seen air potato bulbils on cement in the dark sprout and grow vines. So this is one reason why they're such successful invaders. They have high propagule pressure, which means they produce a lot of air potatoes. And then these air potatoes can outcompete most of the other species around them. They start growing early in the spring and then they climb and cover everything so that nothing else has a chance. Uh, these bulbils, as you see from this picture, will sprout the vines that come upward and go into the canopy, but they also put a shoot downward which becomes the tuber. This is their underground nutrient storage organ, and this is what survives through the winter. So people will see that the vines above the ground and in the canopy die, but this survives through the winter, and in successive years, will continue to produce vines each year. So what can we do? Well, integrated pest management. Let's see what resources we have and utilize what is going to most effectively manage this pest. Uh, the first thing is mechanical control. So uh, in general, I'm, I can't really give months because what you would do if you were in Miami and what you would do in Tallahassee would be in different times of the year because the environment's so different there. But in general, in winter, you'll do mechanical control. So going out and picking up the bulbs. Picking up the bulbs off the ground at least ensures that your infestation is not going to be worse in the next year. And as things warm up and it begins to rain, you'll see vines beginning to sprout from those underground tubers. This is a good time then to dig up those tubers to actually reduce your infestation. So you pick up the bulbs, that stops the infestation from getting worse, and then dig up the tubers, and then that decreases your infestation. Of course, in many areas, the vine is so dense and pervasive that you, you can't dig it all up. It's too much. And so that's when air potato beetles come in. They will generally show up sometime in, from late May and then are around throughout the summer and they'll do major damage to the vines, eating the leaves, reducing bulb production, and I'll, I'll get into some more of those details later. Um, but this is part of the integrated strategy that you do the mechanical control, the biological control comes in, and then at the end of the year, if your infestation is severe and you want to use chemical control, this is the time of year that we would recommend you doing that. Um, triclop here and Roundup or glyphosate is the actual chemical that's in Roundup that's effective, um, could be used at that time. And my predecessor determined, and other folks who have worked with air potato have determined that the best time to do this is the fall because that's when the air potato vine is drawing its resources down into that tuber. And they believe that when it's drawing those resources down, it will also draw the chemical down. And so that's why this would be the most effective time to do that. However, we've also seen that you have to use pretty high rates of these chemicals to have any effect. And generally a single application is not going to do much. So the fact that this chemical application is not very effective and is expensive and that the mechanical control is so tedious is why we decided to use biocontrol in the system in the first place. And what we found was the air potato beetle. The air potato beetle is Liliosaris cheni, and as adults, they'll go around and nibble on leaf veins of the air potato leaves, which causes the leaves to cup. 
So you can see that that leaf is really curled and the adults like that and they'll go inside those cupped leaves and lay their eggs. Those are the little yellow dots that are there. Um, those will be eggs for about four days before they close and the larvae come out. The larvae are not the cutest things in the world, maybe. I think they're pretty cute, but some people think they look like boogers. That's okay. They eat the vine. They do a very good job of eating the vine. Uh, the females can lay up to 1,200 eggs or more in their five-month lifetime and produce so thousands of these larvae. Uh, they stay larva chewing on the leaves like that for about um, 12 days to two weeks, and then they pupate. Uh, pupation is the metamorphic point in an insect's life cycle when they form a hard cocoon around themselves, basically melt into goo, and then reform into their adult structure, which is mind-blowing. Insects are absolutely amazing. So. Uh, this is their pupation period. They fall into the soil. They actually pupate gregariously, meaning they'll fall down next to each other and kind of bum bundle up into lumps all in the same place. And then they emerge into the beautiful black and red beetle. They have all black legs, head, and thorax. And then the elytra or the outer wings are that really bright red color and um, somewhat oblong, not a circular like a ladybug and not with any spots. So some people um, say, oh, they look like ladybugs and they kind of do, um, but they're certainly obviously very different organisms. And we chose the air potato beetle because um, they do a lot of damage. So when I was speaking about why we select certain biological control agents, they need to do a lot of damage. Well, the air potato beetle definitely does. Uh, in the background of this picture, you see a leaf there with some large holes in it. That's the damage that the adult does. And then in the front of the picture, you see the larva skeletonizing the leaf. So the larva do more damage than the adults do. They're really the damaging stage of this insect, but together the adults and larva massively reduce the biomass of the vine. There was a field study that went over the course of five years. And from year one to year five, at those field sites, there was an 85% reduction in the biomass of the vine. And at the same time at those sites over that time period, there was a 95% reduction of the biomass of the bulbuls. So some of you might remember we used to have air potato roundups. The reason that we don't have them as much anymore is because there are so many fewer bulbuls, and that's thanks to the beetles. The beetles feeding on the vines not only reduce that tissue, but they reduce the resources that the vines have and their ability to produce the bulbs. So this is awesome evidence to show that they're very damaging. They're very much reducing and limiting the vine invasion. Also, they're great flyers. In one study um, by Bill Overholt in 2016, he published a study saying that they could fly as much as 8.2 kilometers. Um, but one of my predecessors, who's actually the uh, Bureau Chief of Biocontrol Methods and Development at DPI did a release on one side of Newman's Lake and then traveled around as far as 25 kilometers onto the other side and found beetles and that was the only release point in that area. So we think that within a year they can travel anywhere from 8 to 25 kilometers which would be um, like 5 to 15 miles. So they're good flyers, good dispersers, and other studies have shown that they are very much established across and have spread across Florida. From 113 sites investigated in 2015, 97 of those sites either had the beetles or clear evidence of beetle feeding. So we know they're established, they're around, they're, they're moving, and they're also very cost effective. So um, there was one study done that showed that management of air potato vine in just one hectare per year in the Everglades and other invasive species was going to be uh, $1,750. And I extrapolated that number as to if it was the entire Everglades, that would be a billion dollars a year to manage the air potato vine and other invasive species in the Everglades. Whereas our program is for the entire state of Florida and it's only about 175K. So I know that this is a bit of an unfair example because in the first number, other invasive species are included, but I think it shows that our program is relatively cost-effective, especially because we've put in the input now 
And as I said, the goal of a biocontrol program is not to last forever, and the beetles are becoming established. So we put in this effort now in hopes that there will be minimal costs and input in the future. And the final point, and the most important reason the air potato beetle was chosen, is that it's extremely host specific. There have been no non target effects. They may take a bite out of something. Uh, there's a couple other Dioscoria species that we've seen them in containment eat less than a gram of, but they can't reproduce off of them. They can't survive off of them. They will die of starvation off of any other plant. And the picture I have here shows that you can see a lot of feeding and munching and leaves turning brown. That's the Dioscoria bulbifera, the invasive air potato. The other plant that's really healthy and green and has no bite marks is Dioscoria alata, a very closely related species that the beetles won't eat at all. So even though some of you might not be able to tell that there's two different plant species there, there are, and the beetles can definitely tell. So they've been this uh, successful because they are extremely host specific. Uh, we do have more research to do with the air potato beetle, so there is a reason that the program is still running. And as I said, they're established around the state of Florida. They've been in a lot of, um, a lot of areas that we've investigated, but some of the sites that they didn't show up in the study I mentioned and some areas that they're still not showing up are in the southern counties. I have several field sites in Miami-Dade County, and I haven't found a single beetle there yet this year. So for some reason, they're not establishing well down there, and we need to figure out why. Um, one thing is that they might not be doing well in that heat. Uh, Veronica Manrique worked on the air potato beetle when she was here at UF, and she's since moved to Southern University in Louisiana, and she's still collaborating with me on several projects with the air potato beetle. But a previous study that she had done was to look at how temperature affects the air potato beetle's life cycle, and what she found was that the beetle's eggs do not hatch if they're over 30 degrees Celsius. That's about 90 degrees Fahrenheit. And I know that even in the South, it does get back below 90 at night. So this might not be the only reason, but it might be a contributing factor. So we're definitely trying to look into that. Another thing that happens down in the Miami area that is different across the state of Florida is that they have a lot of mosquitoes. It's not that the mosquitoes are competing with the air potato beetles, it's that people are spraying pyrethroids, which are a broad spectrum insecticide, that if the insect comes in contact with it, it will kill the beetles, or if the insecticide is on air potato um, leaf material and the beetles eat that material, the residual could be long lasting enough that it then kills the beetle. So we're trying to look into some of the reasons about why the beetle hasn't established as well in the South. That's definitely one of our research goals. Another thing that we're looking at is how good is the beetle for other states? The air potato vine is causing a lot of issues with the environment, having a very negative impact in Texas, Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama, and Georgia. I've also received photos from folks this year in Washington, D.C. and Indiana who have the vine. We don't know how pervasive the vine will be uh, up further north. In its native range, it does get down to freezing, uh, but we don't know how bad it's going to be here in our northern states. Um, we do know that it is pretty bad across the south, and we have started shipping beetles to several of these other states. So if you look at our air potato beetle website with FDAX, there is a form for people from out of state to request beetles from us, and we have been shipping beetles to them, and so far are seeing success. Um, but we still need to do some research to make sure that uh, the beetles are going to be successful there. And something I haven't mentioned yet is that we actually have two biotypes. We have beetles that we source from Nepal and beetles that we source from China. And their native uh, environmental variables are slightly different. So it may be better to release one biotype over the other in certain states depending on their environment. Another thing that we're looking at is the air potato beetles overwintering strategy. Uh, as I said, in its native range, it does get down to freezing. The beetles experience snow and very cold winters. They do something that we call diapause, which is basically hibernation for insects. So they'll crawl down into the soil, sleep for four months, and then come back out. Obviously, it doesn't get that cold here, and we're not sure exactly what they do in the winter. We know they disappear 
sometime in October or November, and then we don't see them again until late May. So there's something that's happening. They're going somewhere. And we've done some studies in my lab, uh, nothing that's ready to be published yet, but we have seen that if we keep the beetles at 55 degrees Fahrenheit for a week or more, they do crawl down into the sides of our terrariums, stop moving and stop feeding. So they can go into diapause at that temperature and it does get that cool here. But in areas like Miami, it doesn't stay that cold. And so it is possible that they're actually staying awake through the winter, the vine is dying off and then they're starving to death. So our spring population numbers are very low. That could have something to do with establishment. Again, um, I'm just uh, saying what I know so far and saying that we need to do more research because I don't actually have the answer here yet. And the last thing that we're doing is uh, looking at the life cycle of the vine and the beetle. So there have been a lot of great studies in the field looking at how the air potato beetle affects the vine, its biomass, foliar production, their establishment, their spread. Uh, but we don't have uh, perfect information about exactly when the vine comes out in different areas and when the beetle does. So initially there was kind of a general thought that the vine comes up and a month later the beetles are there. But what I've seen is that the vines came up in around Gainesville, for example, in April, but then the beetles didn't show up until early June. So there seems to be a bigger lag there than what we anticipated. And I think that it has something to do with the amount of air potato tissue that's available for the beetles to colonize. And I'll talk a little bit more about uh, the density of the vine and that associa the association it has with beetle populations um, in a little bit. But this is definitely an area of research that I'm very passionate about. And we go out every week to different sites, either around Gainesville, around Tampa, or we go once a month down to Miami, where, as I said, I haven't found any beetles yet this year. And we do assessments on the vine, its, bio, its density, the beetles, their population, and we're trying to um, make some connections between their life cycles. And I hope that we can find something that gives us some answers about how these organisms are interacting in this new ecosystem and maybe even something that we can take advantage of uh, to manipulate them and get even better management of the vine. Uh, currently, the current state of the program is that beetles are established. Uh, the USDA and University of Florida worked very hard with us at FDAX to get these beetles released across the state and get this uh, system going where people could request beetles from FDAX or UF and we would ship them out and we've, we've had a huge success. The beetles are established in many areas across the state. They are managing those invaded areas, absolutely reducing the biomass and bulbal density. And as I mentioned from my website, we have had a request previously where individual residents could request air potato beetles from us. Um, but I just arrived last October and as of May, I checked in with my lab technician and she said, hey, we've got over 2,500 requests now. And in the history of the program, we've never from our location filled more than 1,600 in a year. And so I had to shut down our link because it was going to be, we're already not going to be able to fill all of the requests. So it's exciting because people are aware of the program. People understand that the beetle is highly beneficial and they want it. But unfortunately, I'm having to turn a lot of people away because we have too many requests. We're just overwhelmed. Um, we can only produce about 50,000 beetles a year. And so far, we've shipped out about 15,000. So I'm hoping that we can uh, at least double, if not triple that before the end of the year. But we're a bit overwhelmed at the moment. And so this is causing us to make some changes in the program. And as I said, high densities of air potato support high densities of beetles. And so one change that we're making is instead of people directly requesting beetles, we're going to have people report where they have air potato vine so that we can get an idea of where the largest densities of the vine are and make sure that we're shipping beetles to the areas that need it most. We also want to really focus on uh, areas where the beetles have not established and our nature preserves, our state parks and conservation areas. So in another study, they showed that if you just release 10 beetles in a location, you might, you basically have a 50-50 chance that they'll establish. 
But if you release 100 beetles at a location, you've got more like an 85% chance that they'll establish. So while we'll be, we won't be taking direct requests anymore, we'll be using the information from the air potato vine reporting to determine where densities are high, where beetles have or haven't established, and we'll be wrapping up the program in these next couple of years with targeting those specific areas and focusing on the research that I talked about earlier. So overall, the state of the program is that it's very successful and a lot of people have gotten involved and I think have had a really positive experience with it. One last thing about Air Potato um, is that we have a citizen science project called the Air Potato Patrol. This is done through the University of Florida with uh, Dr. William Lester. He started this program with my predecessor in 2016. This is a way for as many members of the public as possible to get involved with our program and to learn about the air potato and spread information. I've got the, the website there, it's simpleairpotatobeetle.com. Um, it's a great way to become involved with a really cool citizen science project. We're sending out surveys to everyone to ask about when they start seeing the vine, when they start seeing the beetle. And I hope that I can compare that information to what I'm seeing from my field research and get a better picture of what's happening over the course of the entire state because I can only go to so many field sites. So the citizen science I think is really important. Um, I kind of wanna I wrap it up now with just some broad strokes about biological control. Um, there are many benefits to biological control. As I've said, it's cost effective, it's long-term, it's sustainable, and there is a lot to observe and learn from these introductions. So myself and Veronica in Louisiana both have students that are working, gaining important knowledge on how to become scientists with a, this opportunity to look at invaders. So it's a really cool and controlled way to look at invasion biology. And we're definitely taking advantage of that. But we can't ignore the fact that there are costs. Um, there's potential to fail along the way. Well, there's also, if it's not done correctly, we've seen that the consequences can be horrific. So there's absolutely a long process that has to be followed. And along that process, there are points where you can fail. If you fail at the beginning, where the host specificity, host specificity is too broad, you haven't invested too many resources yet at that point, so that's not cool. You've definitely had some loss, but you've learned something important and you have to move on from there. Um, if you get to the next step where it is host specific and you import that agent into quarantine and start to try to mass rear it, but you fail at rearing for one reason or another, well, then you've put in even more resources and still have no solution. And then if you actually do get it to be successfully mass reared and you release it, but it doesn't establish, well, then you're, it still hasn't worked out. So there are costs to, to this method that I think it's only fair to acknowledge. Um, so back to the big question, do two wrongs make a right? Well, the answer is a very solid sometimes. If it is done correctly, and if you can find an agent that fulfills all of the criteria to make it safe, it can be very successful, but it's not going to be something that can be used in every system, and it's not a magic bullet. It doesn't happen quickly. As we saw from the study I mentioned, that was over the course of five years. So biological control doesn't happen overnight. It's a long-term solution. Um, and it is just one tool in the toolbox of IPM. So my big conclusions are that prevention is the most important thing. Uh, if you're working in outreach extension, or if you ever talk to anyone about invasive species, this is the big thing to get out there and to acknowledge. Preventing species from entering new areas is the absolute number one best thing we can do for invasive species management. And the other big takeaway that I want to acknowledge is that there has been successful incorporation of biological control into pest management. And when it's done right, it's very useful and, and very satisfying to be a part of. Um, I, that's all that I wanted to say today. I wanna to thank uh, Dr. Johnson for inviting me today uh, to speak to you all and, and share a lot about my project and my passion. I also want to thank Min Raramaji and Ted Center from USDA ARS. They initially discovered, imported, and obtained the release permission for the air potato beetle. Also my team at FDAX DPI, Eric Berg and Kate Fairbanks, who are the um, bureau chief and co-bureau chief of the biological control methods and development area, which air potato falls under. 
and Brian, Cassie, Rosie, and Nathan, who all worked with me on the Air Potato team. And then finally, the USDA APHIS, who fund our Air Potato project. And so now I'm going to look at the chat and try to answer some questions that you all might have. Yes, thank you, Emily. There is uh, some good questions in the chat. So if you can, if you can see that and you want to kind of go through a few of them, that'd be wonderful. See how many we can get to in the next 10 minutes. Um, also, while you're looking, looking at those, I'm going to launch a poll really quick. Um, you can start answering questions, but hopefully everyone can answer the poll really quick. And just a note to any other co-hosts, the few of you on this call, please don't close the poll because it'll actually close the poll for everybody if you do that. For some of these, I, um, I don't have the answer. And so I'm just going to make a list of anything that I can't answer right now. And I'll try to get links or support. Um, for example, for Nutria, I have honestly no idea how they're managing Nutria in Florida. So I'm sure though that I can reach out to other folks here at FDAX or UF and find out um, what we're doing about that here. Um, so I'll definitely look into that. And I know that Dr. Johnson sends out um, something afterwards uh, that we have, I can put links and things into. Um, so I'll make sure to provide some information there. Um, let's see. Yeah, um, so the effectiveness of air potato beetles. How often do they have to be reintroduced into an area to be effective? This is something that we're still looking into. So as I had said, areas where they did large releases of 100 beetles or more seems to be very effective and beetles have come back. But then if the beetles have reduced the population so much that the density of the air potato is very low, it seems like they stop coming back to those areas. I'm not sure if it's that they can't find low density of air potato, or if they don't want to lay eggs there because they don't see it as a suitable habitat for their larva, if they perhaps have some ability to recognize that there's enough tissue there for successful reproduction. So we are seeing that, that in some areas they come back year after year and then they don't. Um, so we don't have a solid answer of how often they have to be reintroduced but we do see variation across the state and within sites as to whether or not they come back. And that is really one of the reasons that the program is continuing to exist because we need to figure this out. So do, are we always going to need to do some, some small level of reintroduction in certain areas or are we going to be able to figure out why they do and don't return to certain areas? Um, but again, it has a lot to do with the initial uh, size of the release. And that's another change that we're making to the program. Like I said, we're now releasing in areas where the beetles aren't established, a minimum of 100 beetles. And down in Miami, um, I released 600 beetles two weeks ago at three different sites. So we're pumping them out there as fast as we can and, and trying to figure this out. Um, they take, for how long do they pupate? They take about two weeks for pupation. It's four days as an egg. 12 days as a larva, uh, 14 to 16 days as a pupa, and then the adults can live for about five months. Uh, the farthest north, we've seen the air potato. As I said, I've got some photos from Indiana and Washington, DC, but I don't know if those are established populations that are coming back year after year, or if someone got a soil load from somewhere down south and they'll die off. But we know that the air potato vine populations are established up in the South Carolina for sure. So as far north as South Carolina, uh, Georgia, Mississippi, Alabama, Texas, Louisiana, all along that southeastern, uh, those southeastern states, the vine is definitely established in. And we have shipped beetles to a lot of those states, but I haven't got a lot of information on establishment of beetles in those states. So as I said, I just joined the program in October. We still have people requesting from those states, and I know that the establish or that the the invasion is relatively bad there. So we, that's another area where we need to focus more on uh, determining uh, if the beetles are establishing there. But since I work for the Florida Department of Agriculture, I can't justify doing too much out of state work because we're here for the Florida residents. Um, let's see. 
what is the process for testing if the biocontrol agent will prey on a non-target in the new habitat? So that was the um, host, specific, host specificity testing. So looking at closely related, distantly related, and then agriculturally important plants. A lot of people ask about that. Um, how many plants is enough plants if you're looking at an herbivore or how many insects are enough insects if you're looking at a parasitoid. And there's no solid answer to that. Uh, for the air potato vine, we tested 41 species before they were released. And that's because we had really concrete results. Like I said, um, there were a couple Dioscoria species which they nibbled on and ate less than a gram of, where at the same time they ate over 200 grams of the air potato vine. So we got up to 41 species there before we felt comfortable and confident that it was very host specific. So that's probably a, a system by system thing on to how many species you need to test, but uh, you need to have clear and concrete, concrete results. Uh, can you take beetles from an area and move them? Yeah, absolutely. The beetles aren't regulated, they're released, they're established. So if you see that there are thousands of beetles in one area and you see an air potato vine infestation in another area, you can absolutely move them. I would recommend moving the adults. Uh, the larvae are very delicate and it's hard, you, it's really easy to kill them, trying to transfer them from leaf to leaf. So you can move the adults. Of course, you can't control them. Once you move them, uh, they'll either mate and lay eggs or they might fly away, but you're definitely welcome to do that. Uh, air potato roundups or air potato hunts are not an activity anymore because the beetles have reduced the amount of bulbils in so many areas to such an extent that they changed the air potato bulbul roundup to the invader raider rally. And they're now focusing more on coral artesia um, in this area. Although I do still have a lot of people calling me, telling me that they have a lot of bulbils. And definitely, uh, if that's your case, reach out to me because in order to grow the beetles, I have to grow the air potato vine. And so our program is dependent upon having bulbils to generate tissue for our program. So if you have uh, 10 five gallon buckets of air potato bulbils, um, let me know. We'll, uh, work, we'll try to work something out. <laughs> um, the species are, um, are they ever genetically altered? Um, no, we have, I have never heard of any uh, genetic manipulation um, within biological control. Um, never. I think that that would be way too expensive, honestly. Um, Demetria. The bulbils being edible, uh, they are not. They are toxic. Please do not eat them. Um, <laughs> the control methods for macaques. I do not know. See, I'm, I'm actually apparently really behind on my control of mammals. i uh, focused a lot more on plants and insects, but so I can, I can look into that. Um, the air potato beetles will reduce the vines. They will reduce their reproduction. They will not very often kill them. We do see some mortality of vines from them, but they are more of a measure of reducing and putting the vines at bay. Uh, the, really, if you want to kill the vines, you need to dig up the tubers. That's, if you wanna eradicate them, that's really the only way. Their potato beetles help a lot, especially when infestations are really bad, to minimize that infestation, to get it to a level where it's manageable enough to do mechanical control, but they're, yeah, not the magic bullet. They're not gonna uh, kill everything. Um, uh, so is it better to eliminate the vine or maintain a small amount to be sure the beetle has a food source? I say if you can eliminate it, do so. There are plenty of other areas that are, have a lot of vine. The beetle is established, like I said, in many counties. And if you can eliminate any amount of area uh, of the air potato vine, definitely do so. The negative consequences of maintaining a small amount of vine are going to be more so than any suitability it'll have for the beetles. And again, the beetles do seem to like dense patches, so you'd have to leave a good amount of air potato there to really attract them and make a nice home for them. And I certainly would not recommend that. Uh, does water hyacinth have a biological pest used to control it? Yes, uh, we have in the United States released Megamelis scutellaris, the plant hopper. Um, I think we've also released two weevils both of them in the genus Icornia. 
they have larvae that burrow into the water hyacinth and have been pretty effective. So I think that that's three agents in Florida that have been released against water hyacinth. I am just getting into the water weeds in Florida and I've been focusing on salvinia and hydrilla. I haven't learned a lot yet about water hyacinth, but I do know that those three organisms have been released. So it is, I'm just going to pop in really quick. It is four o'clock, so I do want, you can keep a asking questions or answering questions. Uh, there's still 77 people on the call. So, uh, but I do just want to say thank you everyone for joining. And um, again, this will be posted online. The video will be in probably uh, next, probably next week b before it will be up. So um, you can always rewatch it if there are things you missed that you want to, that you want to learn about. And um, thank you, thank you everyone for joining. So, and again, you can keep answering questions if you would like. I'm happy to stay on for another few minutes. Sure, I'll, oh yeah, I'll stay on till 4.05. Um, the name of the plant similar is Dioscoria alata, A-L-A-T-A, alata. Um, it is also actually a, a, a non-native plant but it doesn't have the propensity or propagule pressure, the ability to reproduce the way that the in our potato vine that we are controlling does. So it's not considered to be invasive, although it is exotic, but the beetles do absolutely leave it alone. Um, how about integrating air potato vine management into master gardeners? So, I have had some folks associated with Master Gardener programs reach out to me. I have distributed some information to them. And when I first joined this program, it was my hope that I could come and do some talks and some outreach. Um, but of course, because of COVID, a, a lot of outreach has been really limited. Um, so if anyone associated with a Master Gardener program uh, wants to reach out to me, I'm delighted to provide you with our management control guide, um, facts about the air potato beetle. I can keep you in loop with updates on our program and definitely encourage you to look at the air potato patrol uh, website that Bill Lester keeps going because I give him updates as often as I can about what we're doing. So yeah, I would be delighted to be involved with Master Gardeners um, if there was a way to, to get that going. Uh, how do you dispose of bulbs? The best way is to freeze them or burn them. They are really difficult to kill. So if you've got some freezer space and you can throw them in a freezer for a week, that should do it. Otherwise, um, you can burn them if you can uh, do it safely. Uh, the Brazilian pepper tree thrips. Uh, Sidonia Steininger, uh, she works with um, the Florida Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services. And when I email Dr. Johnson, I'll include uh, her information and a link to our FDOC's webpage on that. Um, she is working with Mastering of the Thrips. Um, she just started this program within the last year. UF has been working on it longer, um, but they're collaborating together to get this biological control program going. And so I can provide you with her information on our webpage. Um, I know that they've released the agent. I'm not sure on uh, the assessment or uh, how effective it has been. Um, uh, let's see. <clears throat> The only way to kill the vine is to dig up the tuber. Um, if you hack it off at the ground, that will not prevent the vine from reestablishing. Is that correct? Yes. If you leave the tuber underground next year, it will just grow another vine. Or even sometimes in the same year, it will start additional shoots. Eventually, the tubers also die. They aren't immortal, um, but they do live for a long time. I actually, that was a question I had have been trying to find an answer to is how long do those tubers live? Um, I'm not, and I'm not exactly sure. So I can also look into that. Um, but yes, if you dig up the tuber, then you can kill that plant. Uh, cutting off the vine will definitely stress it and probably shorten its lifetime, but it won't immediately kill it. Um, work in progress for a biological control of love bugs. I have not heard of any biological control um, involved for that. Um, let's see. Biological control for shyness. I'm not sure what that one is. So I'll have to look that one up as well. Um, 
and I thought Dioscore Aliata was invasive. It, it is exotic, um, as I said, but it is not having a negative impact on the environment to the extent that we're considering it invasive. Um, Brazilian pepper tree biocontrol. Um, I can give you the information for our webpage again and uh, Dr. Steininger's information. And soon, uh, I mean, she, I, there, she's growing all kinds of Brazilian pepper tree here and she's growing the, rearing the thrips on them. So I know that she's really hoping to do some distribution of those thrips over the course of the next couple of years. But uh, again, I'm, since she's in charge of that, I'm not exactly sure where she is in the process. So I'd rather uh, give you her information and let her give you the correct answer on that. Um, Mexican petunia, I'm not sure about that one either. So I'll have to take a look for that one. Um, okay, I think that that's, Pretty much it. <laughs> yes, thank you again. I think it was wonderful presentation. Again, everyone, it will be, um, you can view it online, also on the Facebook page. I forgot about that. So the video is on the Facebook page right now. If you need to watch it again immediately, <laughs> or you can wait and watch it on the website. Um, so thank you, Dr. Emily Krauss. Um, this was great information. So thank you.